Well, yeah, thank you for joining us for part two of our discussion in regards to state ramp. Uh, in light of the current world events that just occur occurred, I'm curious to get your perspective on the importance of standardization and contingencies in IT and how those align from an operational procedure approach. We've had so many events, it feels like, in the last year that we can point to, um, whether it's an IT outage or a security outage. What I think we've seen every single time is how reliant we are on technology and how important it is to know who your partners are and you know the, the technologies you are reliant on to know their contingency plan and to have one yourself. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the things that I think is great about our program, so I'm going to tell you if you're a participating government, ask for this, is that if you're going through the security, the state ramp security program, part of that evaluation and that audit includes, do you have contingency plans? We're looking at policies and procedures. Um, so if you're working with a provider who is state ramp ready or authorized or on that path toward becoming state ramp ready or authorized, ask for that because that's going to help you have insight into what to expect should something occur. So I think it really just kind of heightened the need. The other thing that we have is a resource, and I would just make this available to any organization, public sector or private sector. If you're on our website, it's a little hidden, so I need to pull this out. But if you're on our website and you went to our templates and resources page, one of the things that you'll see if you scroll down, there's some zipped folders that you can download that have all of our sample policies and sample procedures for every single control family and NIST. That's pretty great. That is a great place to start. So if you said, I don't know where to start from a contingency or planning standpoint, start there. That's going to be a good, good um, resource, I think, for organizations who are just thinking about it. But, you know, it, I, I think the most recent IT outage, I think all of the events that have happened just really shine a big light on the fact that this is not something that we can wait on anymore. It's not something that we should just accept. You know, it's that I think we were talking earlier in another conversation about we're in the middle of this shift, right? And, and how we use technology. And as we're, in, we're, we're transitioning, technology is becoming a part of almost everything. You know, I brought a crock pot that has an app as a wedding gift, right? And I was worried about it when I handed it over. But I think that um, everything is, is, has become connected. And so it made me think, and you two will remember this, that, that old um, campaign, if it's connected, protect it. That's what I... <laughs> That's what I've started thinking about is we've got to be diligent. We, we can't take things for granted. We can't assume, right? And especially if you're on the state or local government side where you've been entrusted with critical infrastructure, managing data, keeping people's privacy safe. When you're entrusted with that, it just puts a different level, I think, of responsibility. And so it, we've got to shift to that and this is where state ramp helps to verification and validation and ongoing continuous monitoring. Well, speaking of checking boxes, Leah, I think really expanding on the provider component of cloud services, how does state government, how to get started with state ramp and what resources mm -hmm. are available for both? Because I, oh, I love that question. Um, so we actually have some dedicated uh, everyone on our state ramp team who is helping support government worked in government, which I think really helps because we understand our team is phenomenal and understands, you know, just the challenges that can be unique to government so that we can help be creative. But the other thing that's great is our, we've got um, a government engagement team who then works together to say, okay, you know what, here's how this other state or this other agency is incorporating state ramp into their requirements. And they're kind of similar to the way that you operate. Let's bring those together. So we're able to connect best practices or how it's how it's um, adopted or incorporated. And that's been really cool. So here's the support. Um, every state or locality has a dedicated government engagement director assigned to them who can help walk them through this process. We have worked with our committees. We've worked with 
um, the Center for Digital Government. And we have an ongoing task force right now that's about to uh, complete work with NASFO, the National Association of State Procurement Officials, to really put together some robust resources. So we've got an adoption framework for governments to uh, participate with state ramp. And at a high level, here's what it looks like. I'm going to call it like the choose your own adventure, because again, every state to organize differently. Every agency has different level of risk. Um, but it falls into kind of three categories and it's a little bit of a crawl, walk, run strategy or framework. If you think of it that way, because every government is in a different place in how they approach risk management or how they've handled it so far. Right. And, and what are the other additional requirements that maybe are unique to them that they need to still be mindful of. So our crawl, walk, run paths for government would look like approve, prefer, require. So, and then within each one of those kind of cat, big categories, there could be, you know, incremental steps. And so what we found is that framework has really allowed governments to step into it where they're ready and where they're comfortable and then develop a path for how do I mature through this? So at the approve end, we would start by saying, first, let's understand your standards. What do you require today? And we're gonna strongly suggest that there's some kind of independent verification and validation, right? So if you, I'm gonna use Texas as an example, they require FedRAMP, state ramp, or text ramp. So state ramp is going to meet that requirement, which we would say is in our accept category meaning there's multiple paths in and state ramp is one of those. We're gonna tell you all the reasons why we think you should do state ramp as your path, but that's an example of accept. And then prefer, we have some of our participating governments who said, you know, we'll accept these things, but in a solicitation, and this is where some of our resources come into play, we can give sample language for terms and conditions or solicitations. We have IT policy sample language. Um, procurement policy sample language. We've we've really started building out a great library and catalog so that in the prefer, what we're seeing is we have some government agencies who want to participate and say, we'll accept these things, but you're going to get extra points in a solicitation or we really prefer this, right? There's some reason they're going to try to encourage you to, to come in with state ramp. And then we have required. So in the required bucket, right, they're going to say, and this is this is kind of the on-ramp language we've developed, we typically will recommend, hey, make sure they're a part of the state ramp program and, and a part of that progressing snapshot program when you start contract, because it gives you immediate visibility into strengths and gaps, but then move towards state ramp, become state ramp authorized in a period of time, 18 months, 24 months, give that opportunity for that, that journey to occur. So that's how we're, that's our framework for adoption. We have resources each step. The reason I call it the choose your own adventure is because what we're seeing is some of them go between, right? For my, re, for my crown jewels that I need to protect, I'm going to require. For those that um, are still important, right? Clearly everything's important. We know that stuff can impact us in lots of ways and criminals get in all sorts of, you know, fancy creative ways. So all of our all of our solutions are important, but if it's not our crown jewels, maybe we're going to just prefer it. And if it's something that is is, you know, I use the the playground equipment, it, you would not believe what is actually tied to cloud, right? You too would believe. Most of the world is still surprised by it. Um, so if it's something like that, that might be we just accept, we require these three or four things and we accept state ramp as one of those. So having a framework for adoption has really helped move the conversation and giving resources to each of these individuals. And then we offer training. So one of the things that we've realized is that when we are beginning to work with a participating government and say, how do you want to adopt state ramp? We really try to get all the stakeholders in the room. So it's, People from procurement, it's folks from, you know, your information security, your IT, your legal, your communications team, who's doing your vendor risk management, who's doing your vendor communication. It's the full spectrum of stakeholders to be at the table so they can all hear 
what's happening, have an opportunity to give input, and know that we're available as a resource. So we will do vendor trainings. We do trainings at the agency level as well, so that everyone understands kind of when this is applied and how to leverage it. And then we just try to be available as much as possible for the questions that come up and we love them. So every time we're on a call, we learn something, we have a new question, we try to, you know, tackle. Um, but like I said, the team is fantastic because they all have that government experience. And then we don't do it alone. We actually are getting ready to stand up a procurement committee as well. So in our committees, we have standards and technical and many others, but we also are standing up a procurement committee that will become a standing committee in 2025 because these we need to hear from our members in the public sector and private sector to understand what's working, what's not, and what's next. So Leah, as you talk about these different uh, committees and things that you're forming, one of the things I'd like to get your perspective on is how can we, both in government and in industry, be an active member of state RAM? Oh, I love that. Um, the committees are a great opportunity. Every year between June 1st and August 1st, we have open nominations. You can raise your hand and say, I want to be a part of this. We, we did open nominations the first year in 2022. In 2021, uh, they were named by our steering committee and board in 2022. We opened for nominations. So every year that we've had open nominations, we've actually had more people raise their hand than we have spots to fill, which is a fantastic problem and opportunity. <laughs> so, so I would say be a part of that. But then also we have quarterly calls with our provider leader, our providers, any member. We kind of shifted this, we iterated because it's a live and learn. I like to live and learn. I think I live and learn too often, but we, uh, one of the things we learned was, let's open it up to everybody. If we have a, any anybody, multiple people, if you are a member of State Ramp, um, an industry member, we open up our provider leadership council calls each quarter to as whomever wants to participate. Um, that is an opportunity for us to share updates, but to hear more importantly, what's working, what's not, what ideas do you have? So I'd say attend those calls, be a part of it. We also have, right now we have two task forces going on. Um, I'm sure we will have more in the future. We try to open those to as many as whomever wants to participate. Our CGIS focus task force, I think has around 50 members about half are private sector and half are public sector, which is really cool to see the participation there. So if you see something of interest, participate and know that your voice is really important. We do an annual survey. In the past, it's been in spring. We moved it to the fall this year um, because it's an annual survey specifically on our security standards in the process. And we say, tell us what we should do differently, <laughs> basically what works, what doesn't. Uh, we moved it this year because we just rolled out our updated standards based on Rev 5 in January. So we wanted to give them an opportunity to breathe a little before we had our survey. So that will be coming out this fall. Respond. Those are some great ways to be active. Um, and then contact us anytime. We try to be really, really accessible. So I just had a call earlier today with a member. I said, don't wait until our next scheduled call, right? Text, email, LinkedIn, whatever you need to do. If you have an idea, if you have a question, if you run into a roadblock, let us know immediately. And then lastly, we are trying to um, start, we'll be starting a biannual education series that will happen. And that will be more virtual. But one of the components that we're hoping to roll into that are virtual roundtables. And I think those are going to be fantastic so that it's a series let's say on, I'm going to use the word AI or the act because everybody wants to talk about that. I don't know if that's what it will be, but if we had a series on AI, you would have maybe a few kind of quick, you know, webinars or podcasts or something, but then in that having some virtual round tables for conversation. And I think that's going to be, it's, it's clearly very focused in our lane, which is cloud security, risk management, um, and vendor verification. But I think there's so much to talk about there that we can, by bringing more of us together more often, really benefit. Well, one of the things that we're, yes, it is an amazing perspective. And one of the things that we're excited about and we want to hear 
your excitement is about bringing us all together for a state ramp conference. Do you want to share mm -hmm. what's going on, what's happening, and how we can all leverage that event to not only learn with each other, from each other, but just be together sharing our yes. stories? Yes. I am so excited about our inaugural conference. And so it's happening in Indianapolis. We actually have events happening from September 11th through the 13th. The big day is Thursday, September 12th. And that is our State Ramp Cyber Summit with presenting sponsor Kerasoft. And they have just been a great partner in helping really put this, this, this uh, event together. Um, we are going to, uh, you know, any, it, it's going to be so much fun. Uh, we're going to have people from the public sector and private sector attending. But again, you know, sometimes, especially with our steering committee, when we're talking about state ramp, and even if you look at our strategic partners who are part of our steering committee, you start seeing that we're in this really neat place to serve as a bridge, a bridge for bringing people together in different silos of government, right? Procurement, legal, um, which sometimes are together, sometimes they're not, procurement, legal, um, information security, to bring states and locals together, higher ed, K-12. We're really excited to kind of bring this unique group of people together. So there are a lot of events. And I know I see Claire at lots of events too that are out there. I think this one is going to be unique in that we will see these different stakeholders coming together. It's an opportunity for all of us to come together to talk about something that is so critical, which is that cloud security, the private sector, public sector partnership, and how we create those standards in not just framework harmonization, but also procurement. And so we're gonna hit on every single one of those topics. We're gonna to talk about framework harmonization, procurement, and you'll hear straight from some of our task force members who've been working on that, the resources that are coming out. We're gonna talk about whole of state and we're gonna hear some you know, kind of real life stories um, from folks who are leveraging state ramp or maybe some stories before they were leveraging state ramp. <laughs> so, so I think it's gonna be a great opportunity and then we're gonna end the day with some roundtable discussions. And we're gonna have state ramp team members at every single one of those roundtables. And we're gonna talk about a few different topics, but we're actually gonna be taking notes. So we're going to be able to share out with all of the attendees following the summit, what we heard, what our takeaways are, and that's just going to really be the jumping off point for the next series of roundtables and education that we do. So I'm thrilled, you know, so much of what we do is via Zoom or Teams or Google Meet and to be able to come together in person to have those conversations, I think is going to be really neat. We will have some folks from the federal government joining us. We'll have more details coming soon on that, but we're excited to have them joining us too, because it's not just about all of the state and local government partners coming together, but to understand what's coming down the pipe from the federal government that we need to be aware of. What are those trends and how do we make sure that we're collaborating early in that process so that states and local governments and our partners are prepared? Wow, Leah, what an amazing discussion we've had today. We cannot thank you enough. We've loved hearing about your journey the vision for State Ramp, all the amazing things that you have going on and that upcoming conference. So thank you so much for being with us today. And likewise, thank you for sharing your insights with us, Leah. And thank you all for watching. I'm Chris Cruz. Claire Bailey, and this is To The Point.